I'd like to review some about cell signaling. This video should be all review, but that's okay. Review is good. So how do cells talk to each other? What are the different ways? See if you can think of any. We just talked about two in the previous video when we did an overview of nervous and endocrine systems. Those are two ways of signaling. Um, here, we're going to kind of back up and talk about those two as well as a couple others. A couple of these we'll see this spring, but mostly I want to give you some context about really getting what hormone signaling means um, and what does hormone mean in contrast to other types of signaling. So here are some other ways that cells can signal other cells. So there's direct communication through gap junctions. This is the most direct um, like simple way of communicating you can get directly from one cell to another. What type of molecule goes through here? I have it right here. Um, ions and lipid soluble. So these are going to be small. Um, they go right through channel proteins. So it can't be a protein, right? The protein can't fit through a protein. We're gonna see some of this in the cardiovascular system with cardiac muscle. Here is an image of what that kind of looks like. I like this visual. Here's the plasma membrane of two different cells. And the gap junction is literally a channel. It's a protein that connects the two cells, both physically, but also um, in terms of what's in them. So that's going to be electrically and chemically connected. Okay, we also could have signaling across a small space. So opposed to pretty much no space, um, a little space there to a little bit of space, that's a synapse. So that is across synapses is going to be synaptic communication. Um, neurotransmitters are the signaling molecule. This is going to rely on an action potential, right, to trigger this. That's the stimulus for this um, signal to be released from one cell to talk to another. Then we've got a couple of um, other ones that are a little longer distance. Let's see, let me move myself here. Let's just make myself real small. So these are two that um, are chemicals released into the extracellular fluid. So the fluid that's outside of the cells. Paracrine and autocrine are very similar. They can be the same chemical messengers as can hormones, but it's about the definition of these types of signaling is based on where the signals are going to. So paracrine is nearby, let's say nearby cells. Autocrine is the same cell. So self signaling, auto self signaling. These two we won't talk about a lot, but I want to contrast them to hormone signaling, which could be one of the same molecules, this little yellow molecule, but if it travels off into the bloodstream, it's therefore a hormone. Um, also to note, a messenger can be both an autocrine and a paracrine signal at the same time, and probably we don't always know. What does it depend on? Well, mostly in this case, where the receptors are, whether it floats, also how close the other cells are, um, so it's going to depend on the tissue type, whether there are other cells nearby, and then do they have the receptors, because maybe they're the same cell type, depending on the tissue. If it's a white blood cell, there might not be a, no other white blood cells around, unless there's infection. So it's also context dependent. So cool. Okay, getting off track. Um, so diffusion is what's happening here, though. So these are localized, because we're just having diffusion in the extracellular fluid. So distance is limited. If you want to go, um, oh, so histamine is a good example of that. The localized inflammatory reaction um, to a substance, right? You've all had a histamine reaction when you get a mosquito bite, for example. If you want something to travel farther, you put it in the tubes that go throughout your whole body, which is your bloodstream. So here, I want to first focus on this one up here, endocrine. Here's our endocrine gland. is going to release hormone. 
It's not just going to diffuse to nearby cells. It's going to go into the bloodstream and it's going to travel through this tube. It's a blood vessel, kind of like water pipes. If you want to, um, this is a bad example, drug an entire population, you're going to put it in the water supply, not go house to house. Sorry, awful example. So the signal is going to travel to distant cells, whatever has receptor throughout the entire body. Last one I want to mention here, it's a preview of what's to come, is um, neuroendocrine. This is getting more complex. It's really cool. So you can have a neuron that releases a hormone. Um, it can, this neuron can produce instead of just like dopamine or some small signal, we'll see examples of this, it can produce variable sized messengers that instead of going just in neuron to neuron, which I told you before, right? Neurons go neuron to neuron or neuron to muscle or neuron to gland. Here is a neuron going into the bloodstream. Well, this isn't called neural signaling. So that's how we can still say neural signaling is very localized. This is neuroendocrine signaling. So we'll see this with the um, hypothalamus, which produces oxytocin and vasopressin that end up signaling throughout your entire body. So it's a neuron that's producing a hormone. It's a hormone because it's traveling throughout your entire body. Okay. A little bit more about hormones. This is just kind of cool. Um, so discovery of hormones was back in the day, literally hormones mean things that travel throughout the blood. This was discovered um, back in, so it was 1847. Roosters have testes and they look like this. What this researcher did, um, Bertholdt, was remove the testes, so castrated the animal and so no testes and it ended up looking like this. This was a developmental thing. He castrated earlier in life. Um, but then he found if you put the testes back in, it looks like this. So this was a very simple way of discovering that um, testes produce hormone. Seems obvious now. What's really cool about like this example here, these testes that he put back in weren't connected to, reconnected to any nerves or anything. Um, they were, so, they, so that showed they must secrete something that ends up going into the blood. It's not a neural connection. So it's really the first evidence that something's produced by these organs, the testes in this case, that travels throughout the blood. Cause you just put it back in the bird, it's gonna produce and it's gonna hook up to the bloodstream enough to be able to send signals throughout the bloodstream. So hormone literally just means excite or arouse, but it's not always excitatory. So that little definition, literal definition isn't super helpful. Um, what defines a hormone is constantly actually being challenged, but it basically is something that travels in the blood. Um, this is also pretty funny. So. This was from um, 1893. You could buy extracts of animal organs. You could buy a testicle extract, gray matter extract, and a thyroid gland that we discovered had some effects on things. Um, not known quite what these things did, but it was known that testicle extract, now we know that's testosterone, that's actually doping, um, but you could buy it and um, inject it into yourself. So what we've done here is name and describe. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I want you to do a learning check here. I want you to name and briefly describe at least five ways that cells communicate. So do this in your homework. And what we've done is describe the type of cell communication and the type of chemical messenger involved and the distribution of the effects of each one.